Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka. Welcome to episode 124 of ADHD for Smartass Women. This episode is brought to you by Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, our six-step system that shows you how to discover who you are and what you're meant to do with your life. If you'd like more information, join our waitlist at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash waitlist. So let's move on to the podcast. In this episode, I am going to introduce you to Rebecca Brinceau. Rebecca is an autodidact artist. That means self-made. I actually had to look it up. And an international mindfulness art teacher who hails from Toronto, Canada. She has lived in Dubai, the UAE, London, England, Zurich, Switzerland, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. She spent 15 plus years in the music industry where she worked with multi-platinum selling and indie recording artists in hip hop, soul, and R&B, as well as with producers, video directors, DJs, and fashion designers. Sounds very ADHD, all the travel and all the music. In 2011, she left a successful career in the music world to launch her art career. Her Ocean Soul series of stunning ocean paintings has been exhibited in galleries and art shows throughout Canada and Mexico. She now lives in Playa del Carmen, partly because of the pandemic. Not a bad place to get stuck in a pandemic. Rebecca, welcome. Did I get all that right? Wow, what a beautiful introduction. I feel so proud hearing all of those accomplishments. I almost want to cry. <laughs> Thank you. It's interesting. Every single time I interview someone here on the podcast, I always make a point of reading everything that they've accomplished. And usually it's rare that we we hear this all up front, right? In one big blob. <laughs> And when we hear it, we realize that, oh my gosh, we have done so much. Absolutely. I'm just so grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. So I want to start out by saying your art is truly incredible. And I know that normally I start out by asking guests about their ADHD story, mm -hmm. but I'm so afraid that we're going to run out of time mm -hmm. and we have to do your gorgeous art pieces justice. So could you explain, we're going to start with art. Sure. <laughs> could you explain to our listeners what these beautiful resin ocean pieces look like? Right. So basically it's a pouring technique essentially. Well, hold on, let me backtrack. I go and I study the ocean. I research it. I watch how it flows and moves the color palettes and the transitions and stuff. And then I will then paint it. And so that's my inspiration. And so I get locally made canvases here in Mexico by woodworkers and then prime them down. And I basically just put all of my visuals onto the canvas. So some paintings are just mixed with pigment and resin and then poured. And I already have local sand laid down on the canvas from Tulum or Playa or else I actually 
paint a bit of the shading first onto the canvas and then I'll pour the color and the pigment over top to give it that real three-dimensional effect that the waves are flowing and you can see sea foam. They're so stunning and it's the colors and then the resin, it's hard and shiny, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll have to come to my little gallery here to see it. Because photos don't do justice, I promise. <laughs> oh, really? Eve? Okay, because you have the most beautiful Instagram I think oh, I have ever seen. <laughs> it is so, it's so beautiful. And that's where I first saw your pieces. And I don't have a home at all that has an ocean theme. But mm-hmm. I've been thinking about where could I put one of them? Because they are so stunning. Hey, maybe a bathroom. Do yeah. they hold up in a bathroom? They do. People <laughs> love putting my art into their bathrooms to calm them down. And or a lot of people have realized they don't need the beach theme to mm-hmm. incorporate it. It's just a calming, soothing piece. I have a, a psychotherapist that bought a whole bunch for her clinic to calm her patients down before they come to see her because art is triggering in such a positive and negative way. So if you have dark art in your home, especially you know us very sensitive ones, that can be very triggering for us. So she decided to just Ocean Soul series, her whole office, which was quite beautiful. I could totally see why walking into a space with all of your art would just be so zen and so filled with positive emotions. Yeah. So, but I want you to tell us what inspired them because that wasn't a whole lot of positive emotion, right? Right. Well, basically, a while back, I went to Brazil and I had friends and an ex-partner there that uh, were all marine biologists and oceanographers and so on and so forth. So while I was in Brazil, we would actually go down to the coastline of Sao Paulo and we would go to the ocean and we would carve out a certain square footage and they repeat it every year. And then we pull the garbage from every square footage that they carve out. And then we weighed it and studied it. And so there was, you know, Coca-Cola bottles from China and shampoo bottles from, from Poland, just all of this garbage coming onto the shore And it also comes from the city. All of these beach cities don't realize where the garbage is, you know, coming from. However, you know, wind can sweep all the garbage from the city path onto the beach and into the ocean. So basically it was inspired by a really dark story in, in, you know, in terms of the environment. And the biologists then go and uh, they, they get their, sorry, they collect their research And they put it into scientific publications. And for me, I'm an artist, so I wanted to tell the story through my lens and through my art. I'm a visual storyteller is how I best explain myself. And that's how it was seated. Amazing. Amazing. That was really sloppy. Sorry, by the way. No, absolutely not. We're all ADHD and I totally understand what it is that you were saying. So I'm sure our listeners do as well. And it's it's just to me always so interesting to hear what inspires people, whether it's in art or medicine or, you know, law. I, I just, I love those kinds of stories. Great. <laughs> so let's talk about your ADHD diagnoses. Can we? Yeah, absolutely. I was diagnosed at the age of 15. Growing up, I'm from a small village in uh, Erin, Ontario. I was raised in a small village and I have a twin brother with a linear brain. I have to put that out there. And so it was just really obvious who the hyper twin was. He was very calm and I was super excitable was very curious. I was very rebellious, extremely rebellious. What do you mean by that? um, Rules, you know, we don't, as ADHD or, you know, challenging the status quo, being a bit of a rebel, pushing limits, we don't always take rules so seriously, even if it's coming from my mom and dad. And so I just felt like I I just like to push a little bit more. And if I didn't agree with it, I would still probably do it. You know, if they told me I couldn't do something, I would do it. I don't know why it was 
just, it was just in me to keep pushing and pushing. And so I, I was just very creative, disruptive, you know, and I very curious. And so all of these things really stood out. And I started playing soccer at the age of five with boys with my twin brother and on to a whole boys league because there wasn't enough girls to make up a team. And so, you know, that gave me a lot of strength and confidence <laughs> playing such, such, such great soccer with a bunch of boys that led me to an all boys rep league, you know? And so I just feel like my ADHD really showed throughout the years. And then I was diagnosed at the age of 15. Did it show up in schoolwork too? I mean, were you rebellious and challenging with teachers? Yes, all the time. I was always questioning them, like, why not this way and why not that way? And also, I retained nothing. My mom eventually was starting to challenge me in a sense where we were doing my homework together at night. And then she would realize that I was retaining things in the moment. And then she would ask me about my homework that I learned the night before. I retained nothing. And so it was very obvious that there was a huge difference between myself and my twin brother. And was your twin brother no problem at all? Straight A student? Tracy, he's brilliant as well, you know. So he's academic, athletic. Mm -hmm. He's just the full package. No creativity. We're polar opposite. (laughs) I have all the energy, all the creativity. He has all the calmness all of the planning, great executive functioning, you know, just sometimes I just sit beside him to calm myself. You know, it was really important to just relax myself because you know what's going on my brain versus his. So were you competitive with him or was it more just, I don't know, did you look up to him? Did you want to be like him or did you both have your own set of strengths and you were just like, you know, you worked out well together? Yes, exactly. So we both had our set of strengths and neither of us were trying to be like each other. He didn't understand me at all and vice versa. So, you know, growing up in this beautiful, small nature village, it was very safe. So I would always be going out socializing all the time and he'd be staying home and doing his homework and his due diligence. And then... Uh In school, we were separated at quite a young age because my parents didn't want us to be together so much. And also, it turns out I would get upset because the teachers would come and parade my twin brother into my classroom and talk about all of his great achievements (laughs) if he did really good on a quiz or a test. I'm sitting there looking at my twin brother, like, how do you do these things? We're twins. Like, carve this ADHD out of me so I can just... You know, I I didn't want to be like him, but I wanted to do well in school because that was what was put into us by society. You have to get grade eight or eight grades and you have to be great at school. And, you know, our brains, as you said, are not designed to remember. They're they're designed to think and for me, create. So, yeah, the schools just kill creativity and my, my twin just excelled and I was terrible at school. Were you really good socially, though? Oh, yeah. I ch- I'm a champion socialite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, champion. And I was great at gym and great in the arts, but you put me anywhere else and I was, I, I just sunk, you know, because how can you have an ADHD person sit for that long and retain, you know, it just schools weren't built for us in those days. They weren't creative. They weren't open. You know, my teachers didn't change anything. Once I got diagnosed, I was put on Ritalin and sleeping pills at night, mind you, because I was diagnosed with ADHD and insomnia. So, you know, eventually I took myself off the Ritalin and the sleeping pills very shortly after, a couple of months after, because it took away my superpowers and my spidey senses. (laughs) So how did all of this affect your self-esteem when you had this brother who was, you know, so, I mean, uh, he performed so well. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that you knew you were smart. Did you know you were smart? Yeah, I did. And that's what kept my fire going. I knew I was. I just knew it wasn't in that traditional way. And so I would be creating all these incredible things out in the forest and at home. And, you know, I was just such an artist and dancer 
I was a huge dancer. You just like, I would never stop moving because music is really in me, you know, it's in my soul. And so I just felt like I was really blessed at something. I don't know exactly what, but I was ridiculously confident. And I think it also came from, from playing soccer, you know, uh-huh. with, and being such an all-star soccer player against, you know, all these boys in these other villages and winning all the time. And it, yeah, I think that was kind of my dopamine hit back then. <laughs> yeah. Well, and at least you were really good at a few things. It right. may not have been at school, but it sounds like everything else, you were pretty kick-ass. Right. <laughs> it's how I saw it, you know, not not my teachers, obviously, or society, but that's not, I wasn't there to impress them. That's for sure. What about your parents? What did they think? Mm, my parents, well, you know, having my twin brother being so chill and simple, you know, they were very much more focused on me because they were, they were confused. Because, you know, they were like, okay, she's not retaining things. What is this? Like, what, what is wrong with her? But let's fast forward. My parents both have it. Oh. You know? And then most of my, my siblings, a lot of my, my cousins and, you know, uncles and aunts have it. And so it's just my parents were trying to figure out what was wrong with me. But, you know, back then they weren't like, hey, you got diagnosed. Let's diagnose your whole family lineage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, my parents were confused. They loved my energy. My mom felt like I was a bit of a tornado you know, and I was like, just run in the house, grab a bunch of things and run back out and play with my friends. And, you know, yeah. I think that's so interesting because I think there is something about parents with ADHD who have kids also with ADHD and some of them, you know, you know, reject it outright, which is really sad. But I remember even, you know, me with my son. And of course, I didn't know I had ADHD. And, you know, he would do things like we were part of the Catholic Church at the time because my my daughter went to a Catholic school and my son ultimately went there as well. And I still remember him at two years old. He had just learned to run and he would literally run up and down the pew like he would, you know, we would try to trap him. Right. So he couldn't. We didn't want him doing this. And at one point he ran all the way up the pew, uh, not the pew, but the aisle in the center. And the priest had to grab him and bring him over. And of course, the priest was laughing. Not of course. We had a fabulous priest. He was laughing. He walked over. And I think most parents would have been mortified. And I remember thinking, (laughs) yep, that's my son. (laughs) Yeah, there was a lot. Yeah, I'm sure there was a lot of proud moments, you know, with having Mm -hmm. with having us as kids really sticking up for ourselves and I would stick up for my twin brother. My mom said she went to volunteer at kindergarten one day. And here I am beating up this poor little boy because he was picking on my twin brother and I wasn't having any of it. And she was mortified. But, you know, those are little like impulsive things we do. (laughs) (laughs) No fear, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that that social justice, right? This is wrong. (laughs) Yeah, Totally. So it was just, yeah, my parents definitely, they, my dad would let me know that I was very much like him, but he also didn't connect that he had ADHD. He would always Ah. be like, you're very much like me. And you know, if you know my dad, he's, he's from France and where they don't have ADHD, right? (laughs) Wink, wink. Yeah. And, and so my dad being from France came over at the age of 25 on a whim that he was told Canada is this great place. And he also wanted to study the Mayans. So my dad went from France to Canada, hitchhiked all the way down to, to Mexico, like America, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, you know, who, who does that with a linear (laughs) brain? Absolutely. Back in those days in the seventies, you know, so it's just, you know, my, my parents are very much like me. They just didn't realize that they have it as well. Ah, so did anything change once you were diagnosed at 15? Well, I was put on Ritalin right away with that diagnosis. And my parents were very um, open to it because in the 80s, it was just, okay, you have this. And so you take this. And so I was taking the the Ritalin. And so my my grades might have improved for a bit. However, it was just because of my behavior, not because I was retaining anything. It doesn't make me retain things when I am on these pills. 
Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it just calmed me, but it calmed all of my, again, my spidey senses and all of my humor and everything. It just totally numbed me. And so it changed me a lot because I was, I was made to feel dumb and I was shamed and I was judged by society and the system. And I didn't have you or Google or the tools to succeed because it's the eighties. It's the the era of bad fast foods. It's the era of no (laughs) technology, which I loved by the way, I'm grateful for that, that time without technology, to be honest. I mean, internet and computers the way they are now. So it was just, I was in my bliss in the 80s, but it was also a really, really depressing time for me because I was taken out of French immersion and put into this room that I call romper room. And I was with all of my friends that were just the best people. I loved being with them, but we were put into this room to focus on our studies. But really, we just sat there and laughed the whole time, you know. So once you were diagnosed and you were put on Ritalin and you knew you had ADHD, it sounds like sleeping pills too, because there was insomnia. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like things got better for you. No, they, you know, I still struggled in school. I, I, I did get kicked out um, because the teachers just felt like I needed a fresh start and I needed to go to a creative school And I tried to go to that creative school for the first day of school in September. And it was just too foreign to me, this new drive and this new environment. So I begged to go back to my school. I probably did behave a bit better. You know, my attendance was great. I really never skipped or anything. I was never irresponsible in that, in that regard, but school was my social, my social life. And so then After high school, I tried to get, you know, fairly simple jobs in my community to start working because that's the next goal is to start working and then figuring out your path for further education. And so I tried different jobs in my community from, you know, small factory jobs and stuff. And I just kept getting fired because I can't sit and I can't just sit on and do the exact same job all of the time throughout the days. And so then I started working and going to much larger cities outside of my village to get better work. And I started working a lot into the fashion retail. And then eventually I had uh, an idea that I wanted to start creating um, a music scene for the hip hop era. (laughs) And I had gone to a bar and I rented it out and I brought in all my DJ friends. And um, then it was for a celebration for my birthday And hip hop music was not something you would hear on the radio so frequently or in nightclubs. It was um, very much underground at the time. So I wanted to have a whole hip hop night and reggae and uh, R&B and soul night. And so then I ended up having this event and I sold it out and I realized I was on to something quite interesting. I was connecting. I was bringing community together. There was hundreds of people at this event. I was so surprised. I had no idea that I was, you know, so so capable of communicating this message to so many people off paper flyers back in those days. And then I just went from there and I kept coordinating all these different urban music events throughout the late 90s and then I went to college for fashion marketing and then I was still coordinating all of those events and through fashion marketing it taught me so many amazing things it was very artsy and and crafty and you know we did a lot of the visual merchandising so you can see that in my photos now You know, when you look at my photos, I really think about what I'm doing and how I'm taking it. And even if it's not a staged scene, you know, I still put so much forward thought into it because there was all these elements in that program that really brought out my artistic style. And I kept coordinating the music events. And then so it was very much music and fashion for me at that time. And I was right in my element. And then 
no Ritalin, you know, I wasn't on medication. I was just working with my ADHD. And a lot of the time I would forget about it. I don't know if you've heard that, Tracy, through your times, but I don't know if you've had clients that have had it for so long, they forget about it. I have had, <laughs> I have had women tell me that they've literally been diagnosed three times. Right. Okay. There you go. Yeah, yeah. totally. Right. And it's just because you've had it for so long, you learn to live with it. And, in, and if you don't stay as a victim, you know, mm-hmm. and you champion it, you, you just, you don't let it own you, you own it and you find your workarounds and your tools. Even if I didn't have you, a lot of the, your workarounds and advice is really resonates with me. I'm like, yes, Tracy, yes, you're right. And I'm always cheering you on every time you have a session, you know, I just love it. I, I just, I love your work. But um, anyways, so then I then took my music events to Toronto and I got seen by a friend, Ramel, he would come to all my events and he asked if I wanted to start working with his friend's company, Maximus Entertainment. And then it kind of just went off from there. Maximus is owned by a friend, Taj and Director X, and they do all these beautiful music videos. And I'm in my element because I understand that I don't want to diagnose anyone. But I understand when I'm with artists and visuals and dancers and makeup artists and, you know, designers, I know I'm with my people. I didn't have to diagnose anyone. I could see it coming through them, through their energy. I was just like, I am with my people. I'm with musicians and artists and video directors and, you know, and so then when I was coordinating their celebrity events, I realized that, you know, in my 20s, I've done so much already. I need to go see the world. And then that's what took me abroad. I felt like I could come back to Toronto anytime and find myself back into a career in music. And then I just told myself, I have to go see the world. So I did. And it keeps going from there. And so what did you do when you were abroad? Right. So I first went to Zurich, Switzerland, and I stayed with my best friend, Julia. She was so great to host me. So a lot of my friends had already moved abroad. So that was really, really inspiring for me because I knew that Toronto wasn't just just it for me. I knew I could come home to it, you know. So when I was out there, I was promoting some Canadian artists with the local DJs and radio stations and so on and so forth. And Switzerland wasn't the easiest market at that time for urban music. And so then uh, I stayed there for just about a year. And then during my time in Switzerland, my girlfriend was living in Dubai. And these are all my country girlfriends, you know, not, not city girlfriends. And so my girlfriend in Dubai invited me for a vacation and I went there. And while I was there for the month, I connected with Virgin Mega Store Dubai. And then I connected with uh, a couple of other record labels and I kept my contacts there. And then my girlfriends really suggested, you know, you should move here. So I moved to Dubai on a whim. I didn't have any certainty of what was coming ahead. I knew that I had my girlfriends there for comfort and stability. And then also I knew that I had already made some contacts from my vacation that I had kept in touch with. And so my contact George at Virgin Records had connected me to Music Master that has the rights to Universal Records, Roadrunner, a whole bunch of different labels. And I went to meet them. So I got a job in five days with Universal Records for Dubai, uh, the Middle East, and North Africa. So now I'm the marketing manager of of this beautiful, you know, geographic, history and culture. And now I'm part of a a bigger picture and all of that work that I went through from, you know, college and high school and music and arts and fashion and dance really started to connect all my stars aligned. It was amazing. And Tracy, I can tell you, I finally got to sleep. It was the first time I've ever slept, you know? And so I was like, just because I think things really aligned for me and my ADHD. And so I just felt like I was really in my element and insomnia just totally dissolved. 
which was fascinating. And so during my time at Universal Records, my boss had suggested, you know, there's not ample work for you to do all of the time, you know, with Universal. So if you feel that you can sign some local artists to keep you very busy, I would suggest it. So right away, I knew that I had people in line that I wanted to to sign to our distribution side of things. And so I immediately signed a band Abri. I'm so proud of them. It's a soul band. The lead singer is an Emirati, originally from Zanzibar, Africa. Uh, Julian Symes, he is from London, England. Andre Atherley and Justin Atherley, they were the the drum and the bass at the time. And so I signed this beautiful cocktail of a band that lives in Dubai and uh, then also signed other artists um, and started working with other DJs and promoters and absolutely everything. So I was really, really in my element and really pushing all these different acts and started to do it internationally. And uh, at the time when I was working with Abri, um, I just realized, you know, the lead singer and uh, Hamdan and the band, uh, they were just also creative. They were cross creative. They could draw, they could photo shoot, they could perform, they could pick up in different instruments. I was just so fascinated with this. And for me, that all kind of showed signs of us, you know, within these artists. And so yeah. then, um, you know, I, I just remember a couple of times when we were starting to tour out of our out of Dubai, you know, my musicians were always uh, tapping and they were always drawing and sketching and fidgeting. And it's because they're a lot of the time they're making music, you know, on a plane. They're actually creating something quite huge. And they would go into these other worlds and they would just sign off of of everything around them. And it was to me, I've never, you know, it's really hard for me to ever believe that there's, you know, incredibly creative linear brains, I guess, because I just feel like you almost have to have ADHD to have those gifts come through you. And so I, I feel like I was just in my element with my people, traveling the world, having the most incredible time. So, so that was, uh, you know, a, a and, bit about Dubai. And it's so interesting too, Rebecca, that all those anxiety, all those sleep problems, which was anxiety related, totally. right? The fact that you probably felt like I'm not doing what I meant to do and I'm not, we have such a need to live to our potential. And it almost sounds like you knew that and you felt that and that was what was causing all the sleep problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I could finally sleep and working in the music industry, you know, I was doing marketing, event coordinating, promoting, photo shooting, PR, agent, sure you know, stressed. tour manager, yeah. like I was doing everything for everyone. And then, you know, Avery was getting so big based off my marketing and it, not only are they brilliant. And then eventually we, we brought on Rami Lackis. That's this incredible bassist, you know, to the band, uh, because one of the members leaves, you know, it, these things happen. And, uh, you know, once that band formed, they just took off and they were like on the front cover of Time Out, GQ, everything. They were all over the radio. We were traveling to London, England, recording over there. We were all over the world. It was just such a blessing. And so, you know, sleep might have been a bit deprived, but I could sleep when I wanted to, like my twin brother, finally. So I was really proud of myself. <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely had an incredible experience in, in the music industry. I'm really blessed. So that sounds like it could have been incredibly stressful. Yes. Was it? No. You know, I think it's, wow. I think it's because, um, you know, I, I guess we know multitasking isn't the best for anyone, but, you know, my multitasking abilities were just on, you know, uh, just like a sharpshooter. I was really on my game. 
I'm like you, I write everything down. I'm very analog. I'm not really digital. So, you know, pen and paper was my jam. And, you know, even tour managing with Kamal Musalam and his band and stuff and keeping all these band members together, connected, happy, was quite simple because we have the ability to bring people together. That's our jam, you know? And so while mm-hmm. while all these musicians are jamming together and we're at all these different festivals and stuff, I just I was just in my element. I loved it. Maybe I didn't yeah. love managing so much because it took all that creativity away. So I wish, mm-hmm. you know, marketing is really my my sweet spot. And management just happened because Avery needed representation. All of the artists out there needed representation to get taken seriously. They were a cover band when I met them. And now they were performing all original music. And it's beautiful. You would love it. They're so gifted, even if they're not together. You know, they're all individually still working as musicians for life. That's It's in them. So what year was that? Oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> a timeline. Just approximately. Timelines, Are we talking right? Um, so I, would, I, I feel like I was around, so 27 to Dubai, 2011, I think, is when the band and I moved to London, England. So uh, about four years, three, four years, I was in Dubai and then the band was getting really big and we saw an opportunity to go to London, England, but I guess. So it was about, it was about 10 years ago. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So this, this is something else that I'm, I, I'm just kind of like seeing as we're sitting here speaking. Mm-hmm. So I have two real music kids. Yes. Um, and it's interesting to me because especially in New York city, these soul artists, African soul artists are just such a big deal right now. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you saw that in advance of it happening. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, African music is the base of all music. Everything comes from Africa. All music Mm -hmm. comes from black music. And so, you know, when I'm in and, and previous to Dubai, even in Toronto, you know, I was working with like amazing hip hop artists and DJs yeah. and producers, like the top of the line. And, and even Director X, the video director, like I was working in urban music. And when I was in Dubai, it opened me up to African music. And I was already listening to a lot of Brazilian and Afro beats before Dubai. But once I landed there and I had this catalog of local music and stuff, I was sold you know, and, and some of my artists were performing Arabic jazz fusion, Kamal Musalam and the Afif brothers. So it definitely sparked more into me. And then that, that brought me to taking Brazilian drum lessons, you know, because I'm not just a painter. I have it in me. I love music. I, I can dance on the streets. I don't need liquid courage to move my body, you know? And so, yeah, African music is everything. I love it. So what made you leave the industry? So the band had broke up, sadly, while I had already moved to London, England. So when the band broke up, it kind of was, it was a bit of a sad story because my keyboardist, Julian's wife, Carla, sadly, um, who, who was a big part of our lives and a big part of pushing us and, you know, a real backbone for us. She's a spicy, beautiful Brazilian. Uh, anyway, she, she fell sick to cancer. So Julian had to move, um, didn't have to, you know, willingly move back to Brazil because his wife is, had fallen Mm -hmm. sick with cancer for the, I believe it was the second time and the second time it metastasized. And so oh. we were devastated and not not upset, just a challenge, right? We were upset that Carla was was sick. We weren't upset that the band was falling apart, at least through my lens. And so Julian couldn't make it to London. And then my singer had an injury, so he couldn't come. And so the band kind of dissolved, but we realized the singer can still sing. We just got some session musicians in London, England, and I'm, I'm randomly, one of my roommates is now a session musician, and he's an amazing guitarist, Ruben McKenna. And so we started, my singer moved from Dubai to London, England, not moved, but you know, we came to visit and stay there for a while to try it out. And, uh, you know, he was performing a lot across London, England, and it was just really complicated with us to, to be there and to, to get into the industry at the level we needed to and wanted to at that point. 
And so we were traveling back to Dubai and to London, England, constantly, nonstop, just gigging back in Dubai, gigging in London. And then uh, I I felt quite exhausted, you know, and I think he did Mm -hmm. too. And um, my gift isn't, isn't so much managing, you know, because I'm an artist as well. And it's not that there was anything like, you know, there was no, I'm an artist, so I can do better than you. It wasn't anything like that. It was just, I knew I had other gifts in me and management was all I was doing at that point and all the creative left. And so I was like, oh, this is kind of, this just doesn't speak to me. And Mm -hmm. uh, he deserved better also because he's now in Dubai, I'm in London and we're like trying to keep it together. But eventually I had uh, decided to move back to Toronto, Canada and take a bit of a time out. And then I blew out my knee playing soccer and it just grounded my ass into a couch. (laughs) Apologies for swearing. And over that time that I was grounded into my couch, I was taken off tour because he had all these amazing gigs. Like he was opening up for Sade and Femi Kuti and uh, anyways, I couldn't go to any of those events and that was quite devastating for me. So I decided that was my time. I I should resign. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, we kind of cried it out. Hamdan was like my best friend. All of them were my best friend at that time. You know, it was a lot of love. I wasn't ever wishing to be a manager. They don't have the best reputation, but this all came through love and Mm -hmm. organic movement. And so it just flowed really easily. I never wanted to manage anyone else ever, you know, (laughs) it was just them because they were family to me. It was my best friend, Amanda's boyfriend was the singer from Canada, from Ontario here. So they were all just so important to me and I'm still in contact with all of them. And, you know, we have some good old laughs and, you know, just, yeah, yeah, they're, they're very, it was just time. Yeah. And so when I moved back to Toronto after that whirlwind tornado of, you know, almost seven years abroad and I'm sitting in Toronto and uh, my knees busted and my dad starts bringing me back my brushes and my paints and all these textures from the forest to start working with. So I got back into the arts right away on my own. So Rebecca, what are the ADHD traits that you feel are responsible for your success? Mm, That's a really great question. Uh, I feel like I have an enhanced brain from my ADHD. We all do have an enhanced brain. Because of our sensitivities, we hear things a lot more than others. We feel things a lot more than others. It allows us to create with those sensations. And so I feel like my ADHD in total is responsible for my success. I guess what I feel like I have non-liquid courage, I have a lot of courage. I'm not afraid of people. Celebrities do not phase me. I feel like we're all equal on this playing field of earth. And I feel like whenever I met artists and had to work with them on any level, it was just always about love and just caring for them talking to them. You know, I never treated anyone more special. I didn't take a lot of photos with all them, which I kind of regret because I kind of want them for my own little memory bank, not to show on Instagram and stuff, but more for my memories because we're visual and that's our connection. I don't keep a lot of stuff. So all I have is my photos. I'm like, shoot, I really wish I captured all those moments, you know, backstage with these incredible superstars. And I'm Anyways, yeah, so I feel like my courage, overall, my ADHD, and, you know, I leap before I look, but I I, I definitely have seeded the idea of leaping, you know, moving abroad, and my mom's telling me I can't, and I'm like, well, watch me, you know, (laughs) because I'm that rebel, you know, and I didn't do things out of spite for my mother either, I did it for me. You know, I've lived this life for me and as abstract and confusing as it might look on paper, it really makes sense to probably everyone with ADHD. If you're creative or not with your ADHD, you you probably get me in in some of this storyline. 
So what do you think the key is to living successfully with ADHD? So with ADHD, you have to become your own observer. From the age of 15, when I was diagnosed, I started watching myself and comparing myself to my twin brother, not negatively or positively, but how does he do things? How does he remember? You know, I just started really, you know, it was incredible to have a linear brain twin. So you really need to observe yourself and you have to, to win in this life with ADHD or you will suffer. And then you have to take and learn programs You have incredible courses, Tracy, that I suggest anyone that just wants to learn a bit more about ADHD in a creative, fun environment that you provide, I think is so important. And Ned Hallowell, you know, like all of you experts and leaders are a real resource. You have free podcasts. You can tell all of us what time it is in a day. And it just blows my mind. I didn't have that. And so I think you need to be your own observer, research ADHD, learn what works and doesn't work for you, and then communicate it well. And I mean communicate it really well. I have a partner with ADHD. I'll tell him, hey, I'm going to the studio to go paint. That's my jam session. And I'm going to be there and I'm going to be lost for hours. Food, hunger, don't worry about me. I'm good. I'm in my zone. And it doesn't upset him. It doesn't make him feel like I love him less or I forgot about him. You just have to communicate that you're going to your positive environment, which is like Narnia for us. (laughs) And then we'll be back. And we love you. You know, it's really hard in relationships, isn't it? With friends and family, everyone knows I have ADHD outside of the world. But in my relationships or at life, mostly everyone knows This is probably my big reveal to the world at large that I have it with you. But, you know, you have to be able to communicate, hey, this is how I work in the office. Hey, I can't sit for long. When I'm walking outside and that's me processing, I'm still working. I'm not being disrespectful or misbehaving. I'm still working. It's just we live in our heads and not in our bodies just trust that I'm doing the work. It just may not look like it visually. That's beautiful. Rebecca, what's your number one ADHD workaround? Do you have one? Yes. One of them, okay, mindfulness meditation and also uh, an alarm clock. An alarm clock is my best friend. Let's use alarm clock. An alarm clock is my best friend. I use the one on my cell phone and it plans out my day. And so, for example, this morning, it said, wake up, woman, you have an interview with Tracy. (laughs) (laughs) And then it says, Tracy's going to call you soon. So I I break it down to even the last minute. And I have to see what it is on my alarm clock on my phone to know why I need to stop and focus. You know, I don't like being late for anything. I know it's a huge ADHD trade is late and flaky and all these things. I don't like those stereotypes about us. I'm never late because my alarm clock allows me to stay on time. When you say alarm clock, what specific app are you talking about? Are we on an iPhone or an Android? I'm on an Android, but it's just my traditional clock that Mm -hmm. I just set throughout the day to make sure that I'm on time for everything and everyone. So it will say like, you know, vamos a la playa. And it will tell me 15 minutes before I have to go to the beach because I'm trying to learn Spanish here, right? And so, uh-huh. you know, I, I, I do try to translate those cute little things, but it's just to remind me to keep me on a clock. And, and you know, for artists, we need those things because if you have a studio that you've paid for and it's yours, you could stay there forever, If you are in a studio where you're clocked and you only get an hour to record this, two hours to paint that, you know, an hour to photo shoot this, you have to pull out all that creativity and shove it into that timeline because then you get, you get docked and you get billed and invoiced after hours. So definitely an alarm clock. Hmm. You know, that makes all the sense in the world because, you know, as much as we balk about structure, it is what we really need. And when we have structure, our anxiety goes down. Yeah. We create it all the time. We create our anxiety all the time. And an alarm clock is just a simple tool. And I realized a long time ago in the music industry, 
everyone showing up late probably had ADHD, you know, to the, yep. the sessions and the videos and stuff. But also like it became such a view of such disrespect to the team that's waiting for them and performances, performances that are not going on time. Like it just, it's such a sign of disrespect in society that I never wanted to be that person. So that's where I got to trump that stigma about us, you know, that we're always like, I'm never late. (laughs) So it's not all of us, it's some of us, but it's because this alarm clock, you know, so it is hard for you to be on time, right? Oh. Because you can get into your head and you lose track of time. You've just now put the structures in place so that no longer happens. Yes. Oh, yeah. I would be late. Got it. I, I probably wouldn't even show up. You know, because again, if we're in our positive environment, it's our paradise. Why do we want to leave it? This is our jam. Why do we want to go to your jam? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. We're 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 in it to win it. So it's just. Anyways, it's our therapy session, so we do like to stay there. Yep. Yeah. So, Rebecca, are you working on something that you want to tell us about? Yes. Uh, so, currently, I have an exhibit here in Playa del Carmen with my Ocean Soul series that I'm so proud of. It took a year because of the pandemic and everything that happened. It's oceansoulseries.com, and all of my information is there. I also teach beautiful mindfulness art lessons virtually, one and one in person. It's really great for our ADHD. I created a lot of different art classes based for our ADHD. And also, uh, I'm working on an eventual podcast with a girlfriend that had put me on to you. And also, I'm really taking all of my my coaching experience with all of the, the creative industry specifically uh, to a professional level where I can really help us, especially creatives in the arts. We suffer big time, you know, from addictions and stuff. And I just really want to have a play in that and a say in that so people realize they don't need you know drugs and alcohol to enhance their artistic abilities we already have an enhanced brain sober so all of that is just is just extra dopamine hits that we don't need you said something really interesting to me too in our communications back and forth you said mindfulness and art is kind of redundant because when you are producing art, you are always in a state of mindfulness. Yes. Yes. So art is a natural way to practice mindfulness. You know, the colors, the textures, the sound, it just pulls it all into the, into the moment. And you don't need any previous training for this. It's, it's in us. So art is mindfulness. Making music is mindfulness. It's, just the imagination and you're just flowing into one focus. You know, it's not about emptying your brain and having nothing there. It's just focusing on one thing and that's mindfulness. Well, Dr. Ned Hallowell, you know, he's the one who says all the time that um, we are not happy if we're not creating. We are creative beings, but the key is it has to be the right creative. Yes, absolutely. And you know, Brene Brown, she also, I'm sure you probably listen to Brene often, you know, because we're creatives, but uh, she said, unused creativity is not benign. It metastasizes. It turns into grief, rage, judgment, sorrow, and shame. That's huge for ADHD. We're creators. It could be a garden. It could be an incredible sales pitch. It doesn't have to be painting. It doesn't have to be music production or DJing. We're creators. We need to be creating all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And creativity is, like you said, it's not just, you know, the fine arts or the visual arts. It is how we see the world. It is our non-linear creative way of being able to make all these connections and put them together in novel and new ways. Yes. I guess novel and new is redundant, isn't it? <laughs> well, y- you're right. Okay. Before I let you go, mm-hmm. I want you to shout out your Instagram account. You all have to go see her art. Oh. And just the way you put that Instagram account together, it is so beautiful. Oh. And I, I love going there. Usually, you know, people put their individual images and whatever, and then you see them all together. And it's just a mess. 
kind of like mine, okay. but yours yeah. is so thoughtful and peaceful <sighs> and beautiful and just the colors that you use. So shout it out. Okay. My Instagram is Rebecca Brionso Art. That is all I can say. <laughs> well, you need to spell it. Okay. Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, Brian, B-R-I-A-N-C-E-A-U, Art. And thank you to my dad for that beautiful last name. <laughs> it is a beautiful last name. <laughs> Okay. So all of this is going to be in the show notes. Rebecca, thank you so thank much for you. spending time with us here. Tracy, uh, thank you for your course, by the way. I'm one of Tracy's students. I'm super proud of it. Gold stars. <laughs> Aw, well, thank you for saying that. Okay. So that's what I have for you for this week. This episode of ADHD for Smart Ass Women was brought to you by Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. -okay. And again, if you'd like more information, join our waitlist at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash waitlist. I think our next session is going to start at the beginning of July. If you like this episode with Rebecca, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And your reviews, they really help in that regard. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me an audio message there. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smartass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smartass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smartass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK -okay system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.